Right, going to forget about it now. Right, today I am going to bake a soda loaf, which is from a recipe that I wrote for my new book, which is, this is my new book, Noah's Gold. And we're going to write and we're going to bake at the same time. And that is partly because it's a laugh and partly because I'm hungry and partly because I think writing and baking have a lot in common in that you kind of know where you're going when you start baking something, you know what the rules are. But as you can see, they may not turn out right. And I'm going to put myself on the line here because it's very, very possible that when this comes out of the oven, it will be horrible. But it might be brilliant and we never know. And that's what it's like when you're writing. So we begin with some flour. I put a load of flour in this bowl. There's the flour in the bowl. And I think of the flour as ordinary things, the ordinary things about life, okay? So they're the ordinary things that are have a magic of their own is the flour. Then the next thing in this big baking metaphor that I'm trying to run here is smelly milk, milk that's gone off, which I'm pouring into a jug. Um, and it's actually not the next thing. I don't know why I've said that. But in the metaphor, it's the next thing. Because if you think of the smelly milk as the pain in your life or something sad or your fear or something you're scared of in your life, then that goes into the mix as well. Um, that, so you've got ordinariness, you've got sadness or fear. You've got salt, which is just like salt. Salt, everything needs salt. And then... You've got Bittered Magic. This is bicarbonate of soda. And this is what's gonna turn it into bread. It's completely magical. I don't know why it works, but it does. Um, it turns this, and at, as your imagination takes letters of the life alphabet and memories and imagination and turns them into a story. So this pile of dust is gonna be a loaf. and It's gonna be amazing. I'm saying that I've got absolutely no confidence this is gonna work because today's been a bust. But anyway, let's see. So here's the smelling, oh, do you know what? One thing. You've also got your personal eccentricity, which is that I like to put a spoonful of oil in there. I don't know why I do that. No one's ever told me to, but it kind of brings me luck. Right, so here comes the, I'm gonna guess, bachelor. So, soda bread is flour, bicarbonate of soda, salt, and smelly milk. And art, creativity, is ordinariness, <laughs> salt, pain or fear or desire, and, um, and also um, bicarbonate of soda, which is a bit of magic. And a bit of magic happens when you're doing it, I think. So here you go. I have to tip this in here. That's, it is very smelly, I have to say. And then you have to kind of make it into a ball. You make it into a little ball. So I'm going to stir that in. And because I'm rubbish at maths, if it doesn't look like dough, I'm just going to add more flour. And that's true of writing a story. If you feel that you haven't got enough of something, just put more of something in. A guy that I used to work with in Hollywood used to say, they say that you can't have your cake and eat it. But if you need to have your cake and eat it, do. Just bake two cakes. So I'm, going to, well, I'm not going to bake two cakes. This is bad enough. I'm going to bake it. So I have to move this around a bit. So while I'm doing that, and now we've got some people, I am so sorry about the link today, uh, on the, I am going to do the shout outs. Here are the shout outs. I'm going to start the shout outs with my fellow writers, Roddy and Eliza, who I'm sure have found the link because they're incredibly resourceful and brilliant. And I've definitely not put enough flour in here. Um, I would like to give a shout out to 5S, St. Anthony's class, St. George's Catholic Primary School in South End. We've been in a Google meeting all morning. You're a fabulous group of remote learners. I am so proud of you, says your teacher. And I really hope you found, you found it, or if you don't find it today, you'll find it at a later date. Uh, lovely Cecilia in Mossley Hill. Cecilia in Mossley Hill, how are you in lovely Mossley Hill? Uh, how are you today? I hope you're enjoying this. Um, you're enjoying watching me suffer. Because, you know, well, St. Cecilia is the patron saint of music. So obviously when you were born, someone had a song in their heart. Um, I'm doing these shout outs because we can't see each other. But I'd like to let you all know who's who's in the room with you, who's in this room with you, who's found their way 
hear through all the, the fractiousness of the morning. Um, and I like to think of you giving yourselves a shout out when I give you a shout out. So Anya Holland, year three, Ashton Gate Primary in Bristol, who has had a tooth out today. So some people have had a worse day than me. That's amazing to think of. 3T at the redoubtable, invincible, amazing Edward Bryant School, who've been working so hard during lockdown and always managed to put a smile on people's faces. Give yourselves a shout out. Mr. Sutcliffe class at All Saints Primary in Bootle. Are you there? If you are, give me a shout. I should have given you a shout out last time. And I didn't, and that is completely Mr. Sutcliffe's fault. And you gave him daggers for it, but today you've got a shout out. So it's him that you've got to thank. Jude, Jude, are you watching? Jude, in case you don't know people, um, in case people don't know, Jude is the son of Sarah Dudman, who is my editor, the editor of all my books. She's completely amazing. She's the best editor in the world ever. And Jude's her little boy, and I hope he's watching today. Mim is watching and Mim does not like her mum's sourdough bread. So hopefully if you watch this Mim, you can tell your mum different recipe for soda bread, which is so great. Okay, here we go. It's nearly done. Um, oh, sorry, Newt, Newtown Linford Primary School. Are you there? Give us a shout if you are. And um, also the amazing year six at Earlham, if you're there. Now, look at this. This is actually nearly, can you see it's like a ball of dough now? That is the first draft of your story. It's a bit sticky and it's horrible to touch, which is what the first drafts of my books are like. They're sticky, I hate touching them, so I just throw some more flour in. Um, and that makes it a bit easier to handle. And then you start to shape it. You can start to shape it, so I don't know if you can see this, but there it is. So that's what's happened to the horrible milk and the flour. And it's already alive feels alive and once you started your story once you started writing the story you get a moment when it starts to feel alive when it sort of pushes back at you a little bit and you know that there's something in there that's going to be worth right you know carrying on with it's sort of alive and it's like playing with something alive so you can feel this this is like really gloopy play-doh i'm making a very small one so it doesn't take too long to cook um, and you have to kind of give it a little you know roll around roll around try to make it into a ball because stories and loaves both have to have shapes so here we go um and it's just about kind of nice to handle kind of wish i made a bigger one now actually so but, so this is ne nearly not a loaf it's more like a scone but there you go there is the dough and now it goes in here this is my trusty bread tin and this is the sort of magic -y bit of it, which is, I need a knife, hang on. Have you seen this up here, by the way, those of you watching last week? The ugly old woman. The big old knife. Because what you do then is you cut down the middle and across to make a cross. And that, from a gastronomic point of view, that is to make sure the heat gets in. But this is stories, you know, we're talking about stories. And forever and ever, people have said, that the reason that you do that is, I'm looking for the brush, is to let the fairies out. Yeah. Or to let the angels in, whichever you think. But so that there's magic in the earth that's found its way into the, the wheat that's become the flour. And you, I'm, I'm painting it with milk. I don't know why I do this. I don't really think this is necessary, but it's for luck, okay? So, it's, it's, there it is. It's, it's ready, it's going in the oven, and it's completely out of my control now. It's completely out of my control, and that's 50 minutes, so I'm gonna look again in about 20 minutes. And until then, we're gonna talk about food and stories, but can you let me wash my hands?
oh my days, this is so frantic. <laughs> this is so crazy. Why have I decided to do this? Right, it's in the oven. And that's the test. And that's a bit like writing when you start. There's a moment when you kind of really get going and you don't really know what's going to come out. And I think that's what this is going to be like today. So what I thought we would do, this is Kiara. Oh, more shout outs. More shout outs before I sit down. Can we have a shout out to Summer Rose? Who wants to know what it's like being a writer? And honestly, I think you can see what it's like being a writer. To Rachel at Pocklington, who's just read Runaway Robots and is wondering if there's going to be a sequel. And to Franco, who I know about Franco. Franco writes, the, writes these amazing book reviews. And also to Isabel and Geraldine. Hello, Isabel and Geraldine, my dears. Um, okay. I thought this was a good idea. Maybe it is and maybe it's not. We don't know yet, do we? We're going to find out if it's a good idea or not. I was thinking that it would be great to write something. We're going to live write something while the loaf is cooking about food. And I was thinking about food in stories because food can be such an important part of a story and such a great part of a story. It's often the most enjoyable part of a story. And if you're writing about food, here's something I discovered. If you talk to neuroscientists about how your brain works, they've discovered that if you use words that are associated with strong senses of smell or taste, then they actually light up different parts of your brain. Isn't that wild? So if you say the loaf was nutritious, then this much of your brain lights up. But if you say the loaf was crusty and moist, then the whole of your brain lights up. So reading words that have lovely tastes associated with them is almost like eating, you know, it's, it's such a deep pleasure. So think, of the word, think and maybe make a list of the words, the taste words that you like, like I like cinnamon is a lovely, it's a lovely taste, but it's also a lovely word to have in your mouth. Um, I like garlic, garlic is a nice taste to have in your mouth. Coriander, oh, coriander is a poem in itself, isn't it? What a great word coriander is. Whereas bicarbonate of soda, this is the point that I'm making. Bicarbonate of soda is not going to light up your brain. But soda bread, crusty, moist, crumbly soda bread, that is going to light up your brain and, you know, melting butter. So I was thinking about um, the best, you know, stories with food in. Oh, do you know what? There's something that, this is a shout out I've forgotten here. Monks mean superstar learners. They wrote a little poem about landing on Mars, I think. And I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it's a robot landing on Mars. I sent my first tweet saying I'm safe inside. However, I felt completely terrified. The more I looked around, the more scared I was. The place was red, red because of iron oxide. These are great rhymes. Coldness, wind, nothingness. Where to begin? Where to begin? So we're going to begin a story. And we're going to begin by thinking about the other great stories that I liked about food. So some of the ones that I remembered were, there's a wonderful bit in The Little Princess where she finds some money in the pavement and goes and buys some buns and she's really, really hungry. And she sees another little girl who's equally hungry and she gives her one of those buns. It's a beautiful scene. It's another great scene in The Little Princess when she's still hungry and she goes up to her attic room and someone has laid out a little feast for her. And you can, you can almost taste the food when you're eating it. Um, there's a very funny, very funny food scene in Vice Spy by Maz Evans. And if you go to my Instagram account later, you can probably hear her. Oh, on Friday, sorry. You can hear her reading it. Um, the food can be wild and extravagant and dangerous, like the Turkish delight in um, the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Do you remember the White Queen gives Edmund Turkish delight and he can't, he just craves it from then on. Um, as well, but it can be very ordinary as well, like this soda bread is going to be. If it's, <laughs> it'll be a miracle if it's ordinary. But I love uh, the Millie Molly Mandy stories where Millie Molly Mandy would sometimes go off on an adventure and she would take with her a boiled egg and that was it. And the boiled egg to me is like a symbol of freedom. I love the midnight feasts in school stories, especially Harry Potter. Do you remember Harry Potter's first Christmas dinner and, and all the lovely food in those books, you know, Bertie Bott's beans and butter beer. Uh, there's a beautiful story about Christmas breakfast in 
Little Women, and if you haven't read that, you need to find that and read it. A wonderful bit in The Little House on the Prairie. So food when you're hungry. Think about that food when you're really hungry and you, or you've got nothing. What kind of food works? And there's a brilliant, brilliant bit in The Little House on the Prairie where they're very poor and they're very far away from everywhere. And the dad makes them sweets and he does it by, he goes to a maple tree and he cuts, makes a cut in the maple tree and the maple syrup comes out. Then he spreads it on the snow. Isn't this amazing? And it turns into maple syrup lollipops just there and there. An incredible, incredible thing. There's lots of great food in The Wind in the Willows. There's a bit in The Wind in the Willows when, um, when Toad is in jail and it's really miserable. He's cold and wet and lonely and sad. And the jailer's daughter comes in. I'm going to read you this because this has really stayed with me and I never eat a piece of toast without thinking of this. She brings in toast, hot buttered toast. I think the chapter is called Hot Buttered Toast. She carried a tray with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cut thick, very brown on both sides, with the butter running through the holes in great golden drops like honey from a honeycomb. The scent of that toast simply talked to Toad. It talked to him of warm kitchens, of breakfasts, on bright frosty mornings, of cosy parlour fires on winter evenings, when one's ramble was over and you were sitting by the fire, purring like a contented cat. I love that. Love that. A lot of good food in Wind in the Willows. Um, I was going to do this quite daring thing. I was going to read you a little bit from this. This book isn't published yet. I'm not even sure I'm allowed to do this. But this is what made me think about the food. Um, the hero is Noah, and he's talking about, um, he's seen his big, his big sister's going on a geography field trip, and Noah's good at food, and he sees what she's got for her geography field trip. So I'm going to read you this. I've never read it to anyone before. I'm not even sure I'm allowed to. So this is a world premiere. If you're off on a proper day out, then you should take a proper packed lunch. A decent packet of sandwiches in your bag makes the world into your happy meal. You have something to look forward to, something to share, something to fill you up. You're up for anything. What was our Eve proposing to take on her packed lunch? A tub of Dippylicious. Real talk, Dippylicious is a tiny plastic pot of some dubious cheese spread and four miniature breadsticks. Miniature breadsticks are not lunch, not unless you are a miniature person, which Eve is not. You also, hang on a minute. Grant, Gran, you like to say to me that the finest palace was just a pile of bricks. The finest loaf is just a pile of flour until someone came along to build it. You said that to me the time we had nothing in our house but two tins of tomatoes and half a packet of dry spaghetti. Everyone was miserable, but you went for a walk and came back with some little white flowers and a pocket full of mushrooms, which you picked in the country park. And you made an absolute palace of a pasta sauce. And Dad... And Dad, you said it was like magic. And Granny, you said, magic is everywhere. You just have to wake it up. And you taught me which mushrooms you could eat. And you told me that the little white flowers were wild garlic. And the smallest pinch can make the biggest difference. A pinch of garlic turns tinned tomatoes into a sauce. A pinch of yeast turns flour into bread. And this little fella, and she patted my head, is meant for great deeds. You wait and see. So Noah decided to make his sister better sandwiches. Um, I used, uh, I took a little, the little pot of cheese spread to make ease sandwiches. And when I'd finished, they looked a bit sad and soggy with no texture. A proper sandwich needs something crispy that'll bite you back like lettuce. But we didn't have any lettuce. But we did have a catering pack of Rice Krispies. Never before in history has anyone attempted cream cheese and bre breakfast cereal combination sandwich until that historic morning. And not to light the candles on my own cake, it was class. It opened up a whole hamper of possible ways to combine cheese spreads with something crunchy. crunchy. So I gave the world the peanut butter and grated carrot combination. There was really a lot of history happening that morning. And I did probably be a bit happy about this. And you might think maybe a whole loaf's worth of sandwiches was too much catering for one school trip. And as things turned out, I was right. Okay, it is. It's been in the oven for 10 minutes. So I'm gonna suggest that we write together for five minutes. And I asked you for writing prompts and you never sent me any, which puts me at an advantage. But so 
I think we should write for five minutes. Have you got your pens and papers? I hope you have. I've got my lucky book, and my lucky pen. This is my fountain pen, which I've had for donkey's years. It's, uh, it's got a bent in it. I wrote my book with it. It's got, it's, it's a little bit bent there. Can you see it's got a little dint in it? That's how I know it's mine. Um, so for five minutes, starting in a minute, I want you to write just for five minutes. And you can write about food, anything about food. So it could be a remembrance about food. It could be the worst food you've ever eaten. I've written some very bad food. I could tell you a story about that in a minute. Um, it could be the worst food you've ever eaten. It could be the best food you've ever eaten. It's the food that you really want to eat. It could be something about somewhere you would like to go and eat when the lockdown finally lifts. That might be good. Um, it could be a recipe. It could be some magic food because there's a lot of food and magic, isn't there? If you think about stories like Persephone in the Underworld or the White Witch with her Turkish delight or Eve in the Garden of Eden, there's quite a lot of enchanted food, poison food, Okay, anything you like. And the whole point is to write for five minutes. The whole point is not to plan, not to worry about spelling, not to worry about whether it's messy, not to worry about if you finish. If you get stuck, just keep going. If, you've, if you if you like want to think of a name for a character and you can't, don't stop and think about it, just put a big X. Um, are you ready? Are you steady? Because I'm going to do this too, and honestly, I thought I would think about it beforehand, but in fact, it, it was such a stressful morning that I didn't. So we're all in the same boat. We're gonna write about food and I'm gonna keep listening for the oven here, okay? And I'm gonna give you a countdown. Five, this is like the Bake Off when you say bake. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, bake. Don't get stuck on your first sentence because you can change it later.
I think we've got about 30 seconds, which is good because I can't think of an ending, so it's good. <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, okay, I'm just trying Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, stop. Um, I'm going to check the bread. And when I've checked the bread, I'll read my thing to you. And after this is over, I think it'd be really good if you read to each other. Even if you've only found all you've written or all you've come up with is one word, because reading to each other is like sharing the bread. It's that like you bake something. Nobody bakes for themselves, you bake to share. That's what's lovely about baking and it's what's lovely about writing or doing art. You want to share something. Um, so I'm gonna check this bread. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna burn my fingers. It's coming on, but it's not done. It's definitely not done. It's looking good, it's looking good, but it isn't done. So I'm gonna leave it there for a few more minutes. Um, I don't think I've done anything wrong. It did, it's, it's got bigger, which is a good thing. I'm worried that it's gonna be stuck to the bottom of the pan. We all have these worries when we've written a story or baked a loaf, whatever. We all have these problems. I'm gonna read you what I wrote. It's not great, but um, because as you know, I had a difficult morning and as you know, I'm trying to bake bread as well. But, but I did have one idea which came from talking to you. And there's, there's a little tiny idea in there that you can see would be quite good, a good start to a bigger story. So maybe I'll use it another day. The soda bread was cooking, the soda bread cooking in the oven filled the kitchen with its fragrant promise and rich memories. The smell reminded Frank of his grandma who seemed to be able to cook, cook ovens full of soda bread while chatting to him. Don't forget, she would say, to cut the sign of the cross into the dough to let the fairies out and the angels in. Frank looked up from his memories. What was that sound? Someone was knocking. They were knocking inside the oven door. Tiny voices were calling from inside the oven. Let us out, let us out, you big idiot, they shouted. Frank hurried over and pulled open the oven door and four slightly singed and very furious fairies came fluttering out. You massive Egypt, they bawled. You forgot to cut the sign of the cross in there. You forgot to let us out of the dough. And now we're half cooked. Right, so some angry fairies. I would never have thought of that if I wasn't doing this. And that's the thing I want to say to you about writing. It's worth sometimes sitting down with no plan and a very short time, five minutes, 10 minutes, just to see what comes out. Because one of the questions that you often send in to me is where do ideas come from? And I can't say often enough that ideas like to dance. They like to find other ideas. So if you've got just enough of an idea, the tiniest, tiniest thing like, 
if it's literally right about cooking and you start, other ideas will come and find that idea and they'll dance with it. So the best way to find ideas is to start writing because ideas just come fluttering in when you start writing. I'd never in my life thought about what would happen if the fairies never got out of the dough before. But now I've had that idea, I could probably write 10 books about it. So I hope you have similar ideas when you're writing. Um, we're still waiting for the bread and you have to, you have to see the bread when it's finished, if it is finished. So I thought I would read you something else about food, not from, no, a book from, from a great, great book about food. And this is about food going wrong. I hope I've got the right face, place. Um, let me find it. It's from a very funny boat, a book called Three Men in a Boat, which has got quite a lot of food in it. And it's food cooked by three men in Edwardian England uh, who are not very good at cooking. And one of them is called Harris, and he thinks he's very good at scrambled eggs. So I'm going to read you scrambled eggs. And then we're going to check the loaf again. I hope you like this. So that might be another prompt for you to write something about a, a meal that goes wrong or a recipe that goes wrong. Whether it goes wrong because fairies come flying out of the oven or whether it goes wrong like Harris's scrambled eggs. Here's Harris's scrambled eggs. Harris said we should have scrambled eggs for breakfast. He said he would cook them. It seemed, seemed from his account that he was very good at cooking scrambled eggs. He often did them at picnics. He was quite famous for them. People, he said, who had once tasted his scrambled eggs, uh, so we gathered from his conversation, never cared for any other food afterwards, but pined away and died when they couldn't get them. It made our mouths water to hear him talk about the things as we, hand, as we handed him out the stove and the frying pan and all the eggs that had not got smashed and gone over everything in the hamper. And we begged him to make us some scrambled eggs. He had some trouble breaking the eggs, or rather not so much trouble breaking them exactly as in getting them into the frying pan when they were broken and also keeping them off his trousers and preventing them from running up his sleeve. But he fixed some half a dozen eggs into the pan in the finish and they squatted down by the side of the stove and he chivied them about with a fork. It seemed hard work, so far as George and I could judge. Whenever he went near the pan, he burned himself and then he would drop everything and dance around the stove, flicking his fingers and cursing the things. Indeed, every time George and I looked round at him, he was sure to be performing this dance. We thought it was a necessary part of the culinary arrangements. We didn't know what scrambled eggs were, but we fancied that there was some kind of magical thing that needed dancing and incantations to cook properly. Montmorency, that's the dog, went and put his nose over in it and the fat spluttered up and scalded him. And then he began dancing too. Altogether, it was one of the most interesting and exciting operations I have ever watched. George and I were both sorry when it was over. The result was not the success that Harris had predicted. There seemed to be very little to show for what he'd done. Six eggs had gone into the pan, but all that came out was a teaspoonful of burnt, unappetising mess. Is there going to be burnt, unappetising mess in the oven? Let's have a look. It's a loaf. It's definitely a loaf. And here's what you do. It came out. It came out. I should definitely be on Bake Off. It came out, and what you do is you pat it on the bottom, and if it sounds hollow, it's cooked. It's really hot. It's really hot. But it's pretty hollow. I think mean, it's good. I think we've done a loaf. Shall I cut it? Shouldn't really cut it till it stood for a while, but I want you to see it. Oh, wow. That is good. Lovely, crumbly, crumbly soda bread. I'm going to smother it with butter and eat it in my downtime now. Um, Thank you so much for putting up with all my chaos. Um, I hope you liked thinking about food and talking about food and finding foody, foody, foody adjectives like aroma and cinnamon and sweetness and lemon and crumbly and moist and dripping and honey and all those lovely, lovely words. And I hope you write something great with it. If you do, do post it on Twitter or on my Instagram account. Uh, my Instagram account is is now like a just a children's book festival. I've got tons and tons of great writers reading bits of their work. And on Friday, I think I'm going to put up the wonderful uh, Maz Evans, who's written a very funny book called uh, Vice Buy. So that'll be up on Friday. Uh, 
next week is World Book Week, so I'll probably do something for World Book Week, and then after that I will probably stop doing this because hopefully lockdown will be lifted and you'll all be back at school and doing normal, lovely things with your utterly brilliant teachers. 